This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, welcome to another episode. Um, we're going to go some places that should get real interesting, especially in light of uh, some of the things that we've done on the show the last few weeks. This will kind of be, I guess, the final round of what I'm basically calling cleaning up alternative media. But it's really a bigger issue than that. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of details in the mix that we, we also need to deal with, and, and I can't think of um, two better people to share this with than, first off, co-host, producer of Off Planet Radio, Emily Moyer, is here with me. Thank you. Good to be back. Hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to this evening's show. And uh, our guest tonight is Andrew Bashago. And uh, Andy emerged, but he's not emerging. He did emerge, we want to make that very clear, uh, in 2008 with a white paper that he wrote uh, about the, uh, the life on Mars. And uh, he later went on in 2010 to disclose his participation in Project Pegasus, which is a DARPA-funded project that tested advanced technologies using children. Um, he has disclosed greater details of that over the years. He has uh, obviously been a controversial figure, as anybody is. He is a lawyer who lives in Washington, did live in Washington State. He holds six academic degrees, including degrees from UCL UCLA and Cambridge. And he was a participant in two secret U.S. defense projects in the early 1970s, a child participant in DARPA's Project Pegasus, which was the U.S. time-space exploration program uh, during the emergence of time travel in the U.S. And in the early 80s, he was a young adult participant in the CIA's jump room program, which used revolutionary transport technology to put humans on the red planet. And so we're going to welcome to Off Planet Radio. He, this is the second time, actually, Andy was here in 2012, but here he is back. Andy Pashaga, welcome back. Thank you, Randy and Emily. It's great to be back. Um, Thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing in the truth movement and for having me back. It's good to have you on, man. Um, did I mess up your bio too badly, given that I, I kind of did that from Frankenstein notes here? No. <laughs> no, I, I came forward a little earlier than 2010 on my time travel experiences. That, that emerged on um, alternative radio in 2008. And then I think my sort of my bellwether entry into the truth movement was marked on 11.11.09 toward the end of 2009 when I did my first of nine appearances on Coast to Coast AM okay. um, talking about my service on DARPA's Project Pegasus and the CIA's Mars Jump Room program. Um, since then, I've given – well, actually going back to 2004, I had been lecturing about my experiences. I've given about 25 or 30 major lectures in four countries, and uh, I've done radio in 12 countries around the world. Um, we estimate that my my time travel story, which is a true story, I might add, has been heard by around 300 million people now, uh, largely as a result of the good graces of George Nori and also in Latin America, Jaime, Jaime Mossan mm -hmm. has, has covered me extensively. So my yeah. story has has been featured in, in Mexico and in, and in Central and South America as well. So uh, um, at this point, you know, I, I feel that I've, I think I've proven my case. You know, I've brought hundreds of facts forward. I've even, I've even developed different proofs regarding my experiences, sort of live and in real time, um, in the mainstream and alternative media, in the sense that I talked about things that later got proved uh, in ways that were impossible to have, to have simulated. So I'm pretty relaxed about the whole thing. I always knew that I was going to to, to win my case and basically be be the bridge between what um, 
Project Pegasus achieved in the early 1970s an ultimate, ultimate societal adoption of Tesla teleportation in real time. Um, because, of course, I was in a program that was gathering information about the future. And because I was a principal project participant, they were using the quantum access capability that time travel affords to study my future. So I went into this public truth campaign that I've been waging, aware of the fact that I had to do the footwork, but that if I let the universe take care of the rest, I would be winning my case and, and having that, that positive societal impact. So I'm just trying to enjoy it more try to let go of the anger a little bit more and um, and and just keep on fighting to bring the truth about primarily what I can offer the public, which is that the United States government achieved time travel by 1970. The U.S. intelligence community was actively using time travel to discover things about the past and future, particularly the, the future, um, in a, a broadly diversified program of quantum access, and that by the late 1970s, we were using one of the time travel technologies developed by Project Pegasus to put U.S. astronauts on the planet Mars, and I was one of them. I did, I, I did about uh, 20 round trips, round trip journeys to Mars during my college years at UCLA. So, um, uh, you know, I talk about what I know, and tonight, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, me talking about Essentially, how has how has the counterculture, the alternative media, the truth community, responded to me? And I'm going to talk about what I know. I'm going to talk about how particular signal personalities in the truth movement have treated me. And I think that the public deserves to know what's going on in the truth movement and why I believe the truth movement is not fulfilling its mission. And so I thank you so much for having me on tonight to address that that set of issues. Yeah, before we go into the core topic, which is um, the truth movement itself and, and specifically how they've dealt with you and how they've dealt actually with many credible providers of information, what I call disclosers. I'm trying to stay away from the W word whistleblower because I find that to be a legally definable term that doesn't apply to most of the people that I've heard out there. Um, can you give us a sense, then you, you said quantum time travel technology deployed in the 1970s. Do we have any idea at all how far back the actual development work went? I mean, are we talking about a technology that emerged between the Second World War and 1970? Does it go back further? Do we have any sense about that? There have been recent claims made that the time travel program goes back to the 20s and 30s. But what I know that was critical is that when Nikola Tesla died on January 7th of 1943, during that last 15 years of his life when we were told by history that Tesla had kind of lost his mind and grown old and weary and was primarily raising pigeons, he was actually developing the technical infrastructure of the 21st century. He had been working on teleportation in real time, going all the way back to his famous stay at Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1899. When he died in 1943, there were two War Department officials and two special agents from the FBI who raced to his his apartment uh, at the New Yorker Hotel in Manhattan to seize his papers and effects. And, and we know even from conventional biographies, and I certainly heard the lore of this when I was in Project Pegasus, that the two War Department officials got there first – seized everything as an, in his apartment under the Alien Property Act, which which gives the federal government the right to seize the um, the property and papers and effects of um, resident aliens in the country if they die without issue and without becoming citizens or nationalized or green card holders, et cetera. So Tesla had never become an American citizen. He was essentially a resident of our country. And they forwarded – his material, you know, prototypes of different devices, drawings, schematics, formulae, et cetera, basically the product of his of his um, protean intellect and and forwarded they forwarded it to the National Archives. World War II was still underway, so a decision was made to forward that material to the world's leading physicists and electrical engineers, at least those working for the Allied war effort, that were then gathering in Los Alamos, New Mexico, under Project Manhattan, to to design and build and test 
the, the atomic bomb. And that's where Tesla's papers remain. Tesla's papers were never lost. Now, one of the technologies was found, which was simply labeled energetic array, was prototyped at Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, sometime in the mid-1960s. And when they turned it on, they really didn't know what it was besides this strangely elliptical device to two basically complementary ellipses that were generating this very beautiful, what Tesla called rating energy between the two booms of the device, the two armatures as they were called. And a technician walked through the field of energy to retrieve a screwdriver across the shop floor and found himself tumbling through a vortal tunnel arriving in Africa. I don't remember whether it took him six months or six weeks to get home, but I remember they said that when he showed up at the shop door six weeks or, or months later, his supervisor actually collapsed, dead faint, because he thought he had been disintegrated by the technology when, in fact, he had been teleported accidentally to Africa. And um, w so I was initially brought into Project Pegasus in 1968 when my father and I teleported from Curtis Wright to Santa Fe, New Mexico, a distance of a little bit over 2,000 miles, in several seconds without injury and without even any G-forces, without any inertia, to, uh, to then take a car and go up to the Los Alamos labs where we met with Dr. Harold Agnew, one of the quintessential Manhattan Project physicists, mm -hmm. when he was the director of the W division. And my dad was presenting a prospectus to begin testing teleportation on adults and children because my dad believed that uh, Tesla teleportation should be introduced in a broad societal sense. I think officially his ambit was to test it on children because if we began using it for, let's say, the children of the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, and so forth, they would have to make sure first – it was safe for kids to jump through the device. Now, when I was serving on the program, beginning then officially in fall of 1969, they found a way to manipulate the teleporter device, the teleportation device, the technology in the box. In other words, what was generating the, the field of radiant energy that we were jumping through so that upon our arrival, we were arriving in what we call the past or future. So I was actually present when, when Tesla teleportation was modified to give it a quantum access capability. In other words, I was on the project when it evolved into a time travel device. But then because of the limitation of having to have a Tesla teleporter on the in the past, like if we were sent um, to a time before the advent of the device, um, because of the limitation that we would be stranded in time if they attempted that, because there wouldn't be such a device in the world anywhere. Right. Right. before the advent of, of Tesla, the Tesla teleporter, they began developing different forms of time travel so that they could just sort of collapse the function and we would find ourselves spontaneously you know, back, back in New Jersey, 1970, 71, 72, when we had left. So I was really present there during several of the, of the explosive years of secret time travel development. I think that's the significance of my account. I was kind of being used by my father to go around the government and get the information to the American people, the people of the world. Before his death in 1990, actually several weeks before his death, my dad uh, sat me down in our living room in Southern California and literally asked me that after his death, I would convene a family meeting and tell everybody in my immediate family, I'm from a large family, basically my mother and four uh, older brothers and sisters and their spouses and children, what we had achieved in Project Pegasus. And then he said, then I want you to tell the whole world. And that's really what I've been doing. I've been, I've been providing eyewitness testimony, witness participant testimony about the advent of time travel in the U.S. defense technical community in the early 1970s. That was the critical time when time travel emerged. Was your father ever able to present or preserve any documentation from that period of time? I mean, he... He asked you to take on a mission here that is rather staggering in terms of the scope of it. First, your own family, which sometimes are the hardest people to convince of anything. But yeah. then the world itself, and boy, do we know that. Um, I'm just wondering if over the years, did he leave you bereft of any hard documentation? Not entirely bereft. I've certainly reflected even in the last week um, that my dad did not leave enough material 
and I think the reason for that kind of needs to be explained. For, for, for a similar reason, he didn't sit my family members down himself and tell us what we had done in terms of being principles in the development mm -hmm. of time travel, as it turned out. I mean, look who my dad was reporting to. I mean, Harold Agnew at the Los Alamos National Labs, who was the principal person on the project he was reporting to, had been the person, the American, out of all the people employed for the U.S. government during World War II, who the War Department trusted to take the nuclear trigger, the Hiroshima bomb, from Los Alamos, New Mexico, to the island of Tinian in the South Pacific, so it could be put aboard the bomb that was dropped on on Hiroshima. So that's what my dad was reporting to. But my dad couldn't convene such a meeting, and he couldn't allow a substantial amount of paperwork back at the House. I mean, in practical terms, he could have, and I would have found it just by investigating his dresser after after his death in, in 1990, mm -hmm. and then especially after my mother's death in 2003. But had he done so, had he told us what he knew or left documentation, you have to remember that that generation of Defense Department engineers had signed loyalty agreements that mandated not only reprisals against them personally, but against their family members if they talked. They had literally signed away the safety of their family members in order to assure project security because, after all, time travel and the quantum access capability that it would afford, our government knew would allow us ultimately to win the Cold War vis-a-vis uh, -vis the former Soviet Union because as my dad demonstrated to me when I was tra time traveling with him, they, and this is one of the great secrets of time travel that kind of has to be contextualized. One of the important things about the advent of time travel in the early 1970s is it allowed the U.S. Department of Defense to hide its military secrets, its advanced military technical secrets in the future. So even if Soviet KGB found out about the existence of the technology, they wouldn't be able to reach those plans or reach those technologies because they were hidden in time. They they were hidden in the future. And we even jumped some schematics for intercontinental ballistic missiles from Curtis Wright to LANL when we jumped from the fall of 1971 to the beginning of the summer of 1973 for in, in New Mexico. So my dad was literally one of these errands within the defense community who was allowing us to win the Cold War by hiding our secrets in the future. So it was just not possible for me. I was able to speak to enough people in government, and I was especially helped by the brilliant, dedicated um, PhD in social psychology, Dr. Jean Maria Arrigo, uh, who I was put in touch with through one of my former history professors at UCLA. When I was an undergraduate there and jumping to Mars. Mm -hmm. And she described for me having done a lot of work consulting the U.S. military and, and intelligence community in the area of ethics that, that defense engineers like my dad who were working on the most sensitive projects knew there would be reprisals not only against them but their family members if they talked. And so my dad was basically unable to sit me down and remember remind me of everything we had done. So I've really been, I mean, I started investigating what happened to us, what we did in 2000. I began lecturing in 2004. As we just described, I started doing radio in 2008, television in 2010. So I'm into about a decade of a truth campaign here, and I'm still assembling facts. Everyone, every several days, I remember another episode. That's why I haven't rushed my memoir to press, because I know this is a critical story. I was essentially the Huckleberry Finn of time travel. And so I know this is a significant account of an American who was cosmically privileged to literally be present during the development of time travel. So I've really been patient, and my book will be released fairly soon, but I'm, I'm, I'm still developing it because there's more, there's more to recover and to explain. It's important to point out as well that you have brought forward corroborative witnesses in, in the course of doing this. William Stillings, Bernard Mendez, William White Crow, yes, and of course La of Laura Mars. Eisenhower as well uh -huh. has yes. provided, provided testimony. So uh, maybe just as we're weaving through this here, just to refresh people or to introduce people who may not have heard your story a little bit, on those three three specific people and what they brought to the table in terms of corroborating the story of the Pegasus Project. 
Oh, okay, actually, let me let me go back a tick because sure. I was in Project Pegasus, uh, helping develop time travel, from 1968 to 1972 when I was age seven to eleven, and then I was brought back back into defense tactical activities in. Uh, from 1980 to 84 when I was an undergraduate at, at the University of California at Los Angeles. Okay, so these are so two we, separate projects. Then. Right. They were, they were, well, they were, they were related projects because we've identified six people who were in both. Okay. Um, the principal person in Project Pegasus was Dr. Agnew. Now, in addition to my father and the CIA agent Courtney Hunt, who were giving me information over the years when I was questioning them about what had happened to me uh, in Project Pegasus, both of them being project principals, and both of them, in fact, residing in Chatsworth, California. So I was able to, to reach my father. Obviously, we were living in the same residence. And then Courtney Hunt also resided in Chatsworth. So for years, I was tapping them for information about what happened. But after I came forward as a, as a whistleblower, as, as it were, a truth teller, in 2004, there are three people of my generation who have come forward to corroborate. Actually, four. Let me describe who they are. One is Mark DePrimo. Mark is a, uh, a professional musician who lives here in North Carolina, where I'm temporarily residing. And Mark was somebody I went to school with. We were members of the same church, local Benedictine parish, Roman Catholic parish. He was the age of my twin brothers and, and, and sister. Uh, and, um, and Mark came forward to acknowledge that he remembers being in Santa Fe with me and seeing the Mercury space capsule of Alan Shepard in the Bataan Memorial Building, which was the pre-1966 State Capitol Building in Santa Fe when he should not have been there. Initially, he thought he had seen it at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. He now acknowledges being in that building with me and a group of other boys from New Jersey, knowing that he never took a plane, train, automobile, or hitchhiked or walked there. And it was when I was still in the fifth grade in New Jersey. So he was an eighth, a ninth grader. Okay, so that's a fellow teleportee from the project. He and I have put together the, who, who, what the identity of the boy who lost his feet teleporting to Santa Fe. We now know who that person was from multiple, multiple memories that that established that fact. I remember you telling that also, story before. Yeah. That's such a yeah. amazing story. He actually yeah. lived down the street from me. I don't want to give his name because we're right. still trying to contact him. I actually interviewed him during my investigation in around 2004, and he remembered teleporting, mm -hmm. but he didn't even c connect it to the fact that he had prosthetic feet. So we know who that person is, and M Mark and I have, have established that. I was also contacted um, during my uh, public uh, you know, campaign bringing this information forward by an actor, uh, a very successful actor in Hollywood named Ethan Tudor. And without knowing that Project Pegasus was – that the, the, the principal defense contractor was the Ralph M. Parsons Company of Pasadena, California, and also without knowing that they had developed quantum access for the CIA in Langley, Virginia, Ethan, a fellow Angelino, approached me to describe how in the 1980s he was teleporting between Pasadena and California and Langley, Virginia, and – um, he also remembers schooling in the Kennedy Building, Los Angeles, which I also remember. So, okay, so that's a that's a, another teleportee coming in uh, from the field who experienced teleportation about ten years after Mark DePrimo and the kids in Pegasus did. Probably linked to Parsons, but certainly linked to the CIA. They were still training cadres of what I call chrononauts or time travelers. Uh, then the man who taught me martial arts in the fifth grade. It was a mix of uh, karate and Aikido. A man then known as William Paris, who became a, a metaphysician and, and shaman and educator in his retirement, who now uses the name William White Crow. Um, White Crow was my martial arts instructor in 1971-72, and I ran into him during the 1982-83 time frame when I was on Mars. So White Crow, White Crow came forward last year acknowledged those facts that he had served with me in both projects. He's got a DD-214 that establishes his employment by the U.S. Army and then endorsed me for president when I was running for – waging an independent candidacy for president last year in 2016. So those are three individuals who were jumping via teleportation in the 1970s and 80s and one of them who went to Mars. Now, on the Mars side, which I experienced during my college years – okay, we're talking now 10 years later um, – 
we had the first person to come forward was William Brett Stillings in 2010. Previously, Laura Eisenhower had acknowledged that when she was subjected to a recruitment effort in 2006 and 7, 25 years after we first went to Mars via jump room. In an interview with Alfred Lambermont Weber, Laura, not realizing the significance of what she was stating at the time, said that when she was being recruited, they had said she was going to be going to Mars via ARC. She thought they meant a spaceship that, and that they were using a metaphor to analogize to the ARC, A-R-K, of Noah in, in the Bible. In fact, they were giving her the advanced technical term, the anagram, for the actual technical term for the jump room, which is aeronautical repositioning chamber, ARC. So in her very testimony about being approached in 2006 and 7 to resettle on Mars, in the Mars colony, with her two then 10-year-old twin boys, Laura revealed that whoever was dealing with her knew their stuff. They were giving the initials of the jump room, its, its technical name. And then so I had William Stillings, and, and then before White Crow came forward, uh, but after Laura and then Brett, Bernard Mendez, a career Defense Department investigator and extraterrestrial liaison, uh, came forward in 2011 and 12. We had, again, another round of about 100 Skype consultations with William Stillings and Bernard Mendez, and then White Crow. So I've brought forward four individuals who have provided their testimony, not mine, their testimony uh, that establishes the existence of the Mars Jump Room program. Now, when we put the, 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 uh, when we put the five of us together, we basically have a thread now of seven Mars whistleblowers. And in order of their appearance, there was Michael C. Ralph in the late 90s, and then Arthur Neumann, who was the pseudonymous Henry Deacon uh, whistleblower of Project Camelot in around 2006 and 7. Then I came forward in 2008 and 9, and then Laura in 09, and then William Stillings, Bernard Mendez, and William Wrightcroke. So I just want to emphasize that this isn't about me. I'm just somebody who's been very busy bringing the truth forward on behalf of my country and of humanity. But these, these individuals deserve similar credit, as much credit, in the sense that we now have seven people who have established the existence of this esoteric technology and how it has been used to place American astronauts on another planet without the use of space planes, without the use of rocketry. Okay, now think yeah, about... And that's actually a key point right there. Mm -hmm. We need to underscore that, highlight it, asterisk, and footnote that. Very right. important point. Right now, you think of think of the strangeness of the claims. You know, it wasn't really true when Carl Sagan said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. No. <laughs> Actually, the law of evidence they only require whatever sufficiency of evidence the standard of proof requires. Yeah. You know, if a if a pink elephant crashes on the at the corner of Main and First Street in any town USA, you don't need to establish the existence of pink elephants. You know, you need to establish, let's say, that the circus was towing. And a pink elephant on a tether from a helicopter, and the tether snapped. You only, in other words, you only need ordinary evidence to establish extraordinary claims. But think of the unusual nature of what those seven people are claiming. They were all roundly attacked, as we're going to describe tonight, the ways I, in which I've been attacked. They were subjected to vilification, character assassination, the loss of employment, the potential loss of their pensions for those who were given them. And, and they live all over the country. They, they have diverse backgrounds, diverse walks of life, professions, trades. Why would they all come together and uh, around the same information? That, that doesn't happen unless it's true. I mean, any court of law in this country, if seven of your peers said you were the guy in the bank robbing it, okay, you're going to be going to prison <laughs> for a long period of time. Okay, so, so I'd just like to emphasize that this has been – Superb evidence. I'm, I'm going to take credit for marshalling this evidence on behalf of those six others, but also thank them from the bottom of my heart because, look, we've done something great here in the truth movement. From my perspective, and I think that from the perspective of all fair-minded people who have been following this case, we have won our case that the Mars Jump Room program existed. We were in it, and we were, they were using the Jump Room technology to put U.S. personnel on Mars as long ago as the late 1970s. Now, this goes into a lot of ancillary components in terms of the actual technology and applications and what has been known. Um, 
one of the things that you've talked about, for instance, is the truth about 9-11. And yes. uh, the, the government's foreknowledge of the events of that particular event. Right. Um, when I spent a lot of time in New Mexico because my dad and I were jumping there. Sometimes I would jump by myself via the teleporter at Curtis Wright. Sometimes I would jump in the school program, you know, the, in the in the social t network or team that other children were caught up in sometimes just by myself, what have you. But I spent a lot of time in New Mexico. In fact, I spent three hidden summers there where I spent the whole summer there and jumped back so as to arrive 15 minutes after I'd originally left so that I then lived second summers. Yeah, double of summers, that's every kid's dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No fair. No fair. Oh, yeah, but those, those six-month uh, school breaks, yeah, that was that was fun. And, and so I spent a lot of time with my dad, and I, I really loved my dad. He was a great man. And I just had a high adventure there in New Mexico. With him. We were all over that state doing all kinds of advanced things for the government. It was incredible. I even received training about how to communicate with extraterrestrials via the symbolic alphabet called a start. But anyway, on one day we were at the La Hacienda restaurant in Albuquerque. My dad received a, a phone call there at the, on the house phone, and he said, come on. We've got to get down to um, – Aerojet, what the Aerojet Corporation facility was then at the corner of Bullock Avenue in Leroy Place in Socorro, New Mexico. Uh, it's not there. There's a little park with a kind of a pond there now. But in those days, there was this C-shaped building. And we rushed into the building, um, and a technician greeted my dad in the hallway after we were cleared through, through the bars that blocked access to that side of the building uh, by a guard, an armed guard. And, 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 and the uh, – the technician said to my dad, Ray, Ray, you're not going to believe it. We've got footage. We've got footage of the domestic Pearl Harbor. And we went into a room there. There were about 20 um, VDTs, video display terminals, television sets, if you will. And this technician popped a, a Betamax-styled tape into a Betamax-styled unit about 10 years before the advent of Betamax in the, in the civilian commercial sector. Of and course said, they did. <laughs> what? Watch right. this, watch this, Ray. And what came on the screen was about a 20-second film loop of the South Tower strike on 9-11-2001, literally uh, 30 years and several months in the future. We're talking summer of 71 here. And yeah. they kept on letting the plane hit the building, and then just like watching Julius Irving dunk a basketball, they would go, bam, and then replay the tape and do it over again. Okay? So... Um, this was prior knowledge of 9-11 on a defense project for which Donald Rumsfeld, the man who would be serving as defense secretary on 9-11-01, was serving as the defense attache, the primary person linking technicians like my dad and, you know, the defense secretary of that era, um, people like wow. Melvin Laird, I guess. Um, and so now what happened with that information is I was asked by Judge Weber – to draft an affidavit that would be presented and then defended verbally, be presented both to the court, and then I would be questioned about it by the Vancouver 9-11 Tribunal. It was a it was a ten a, a ten page single spaced affidavit that described everything the 9-11 truth community needed to know as to why the US Defense Department had moving filmic images, moving videotape of the events of 9-11, at least that event of 9-11, and, and how 9-11 was being openly discussed uh, in my father's presence. People would, because he was fairly high placed in the project, we would be having lunch, let's say, in Albuquerque or Santa Fe. And one of the other, one of the other project uh, members would say, Ray, there's apparently going to be some kind of domestic Pearl Harbor, something associated with the numbers 9-1-1. What is it? Okay. So 9-11 was also being openly discussed in my presence when I was on the project particularly there in New Mexico, because that's where we were sort of really in the, the inner sanctum of the project. And um, so I brought this information forward, and it did not get disseminated in the 9-11 truth community because it was actively repressed by a group of academics that we're going to discuss today who literally undermined the tribunal itself to suppress my information. Now, that's not truth behavior. That's the suppression of the truth, because I'm telling – the truth. Okay, when Donald Rumsfeld was serving as defense secretary on 9 11, 
he was at least guilty of malfeasance of office because Project Pegasus had detected that event 30 years earlier. And if he, if he didn't know that event, he should be held to constructive notice of it because it's one of the most important findings that Project Pegasus made. So yes, that was one of the most sensitive things that I was able to cull from what happened. I was able to draw out of my memory that event where my dad and I raced. We must have been racing at 90 miles per hour because we got from Albuquerque down to Socorro, New Mexico in an hour. And it's 90 miles south of Albuquerque, mm. Socorro. So we were just screaming down there. And we rushed in, and my, my dad had confirmation that they had detected some of what 9-11 was going to be. And that's what they were focusing on. They were focusing on threats to the country. They were focusing on the important events, conditions, and persons of interest that would literally shape the future of our country and the world. So 9-11 was a big deal, as it was in real time. Let me ask you this. There's two, I have two questions here. The first one is... Were these active memories that you retained after that time, or was there a period when these memories were basically scrubbed and you had to recover them? Well, yeah, see, this was, is the, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry I was gonna, that was going to be my that was actually going to be my question. So yes, please go ahead. Well, see, that's where you know that's where the reality of what happened to me and and what happened to me in my life later when I decided to come forward with the information collides with the the folklore that litters the internet from from mind control to government suspension of civil liberties. Mm -hmm. In fact, okay, I have these two sets of memories from. 1968 to 72, and then from 1980 to 84. The reality of what happened to me is that even they, though they were using state learning and to, to train us and, and to have our project experiences where, where drugs and hypnosis were being used to block our intermediate memory after we had done something, okay? Mm -hmm. When I was being physically tortured at the end of my service, which my father never believed was happening, so he was not complicit in it. At worst, he was complicit in not believing it could be going on. I overcame that torture, and so I never forgot my time travel experiences from childhood. I mean, um, I, I participated, for example, in the college quiz bowl at UCLA, and I was answering questions before they were finished because of my my – profound academic knowledge because of the kind of saturation we were learning we were doing on these machines called tachistoscopes. They were like photo learning machines. And we were having a, uh, a kind wait of... Wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. We Whoa, yeah. A tachistoscope. <laughs> this is... Explain that, please, because I have a reason for asking you this. Uh, okay, because we were going to be time traveling, beginning in fall of 1969, they were putting basically... The history of science and society from the year 1450, mm -hmm. which is the, the the time of Galileo, the high renaissance, as it were. The, the project was a curriculum developed at Columbia University called Galileo. Okay. And we were standing or sitting in front of these photo learning machines where they would put a dense block of text, like a page of the Encyclopedia Britannica, in its density of text and photographs and captions. Yeah. And we would assimilate. They taught us to read that entire page in a second. So I was competing in the college quiz bowl as, you know, a junior at UCLA. I was answering the questions before they were finished. Okay. Like only when a few words were asked. And at one point somebody thought we were cheating, but no, I was basically using the psychic ability that had been cultivated in project Pegasus and my knowledge. So for example, they said centuries before Ni, and the question was centuries before Nicholas Copernicus developed his heliocentric theory of the solar system, this Greek philosopher did. So the question was centuries before Ni, and I, I chimed in and thinking I was on Jeopardy rather than the college quiz bowl. I said, who is Aristarchus of Samos? Okay. And my fellow <laughs> teammate, Steve Faber, who would go on to be a very, uh, in fact, very successful comedy writer for film and television, said, look, Andy, we're not on Jeopardy, okay? This is the college quiz bowl. And, and <laughs> so I was, I was actually answering the questions before, um, before they were asked. And then when we left the hall, my buddies from that group and, and, the, and the MC, who was Ben Vandebunt, who went on to be Tony Robbins' attorney, okay? My peers at UCLA did some remarkable things with their lives, let me tell you. But anyway... They asked me, how were you doing that? And I said, I was in this special program in childhood where I was time traveling, and they put the whole history of Western civilization from the year 1450 in my unconscious. 
Okay, so I was almost able to preternaturally answer the questions so the during the conference quiz bowl before the rest. Yeah, but that, the tachistoscopes were, were speed learning machines. Speed That's learning what, tools yeah. using screens, using mm. uh, optical devices. Yes, they okay. were developed All by right. the Office of Naval right. Research, they, and they were built at my father's employer at that time in the mid – the, the early and mid 60s, which was the Thomas A. Edison Research Labs in West Orange, New Jersey. And my dad did leave a reprint of a 1963 Harper's Magazine article establishing the background of the tachistoscopes and his employer in building them physically. These things use some kind of uh, high resolution screen display system? Yes, they were like a combination okay. between a video game and a Kodak, one of those Kodak viewers. Well, you may have to Remember take over here for a while. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I'm sorry I haven't, I haven't triggered some no, memories. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah. Uh, Emily knows why I'm asking this. This, this is pretty phenomenal well, pers personally. Well, but. Yeah, but also triggering some things here for me. Does the way it works is like you are shown something on the screen and your mind basically like snapshots it and then sort of downloads it, and that's how the sort of instantaneous learning happens? Yeah. They started by showing us things like the tiny little serif on a small letter R. Yes. And they, sh they showed us how to scan letters, but I'm, I'm telling you, this sounds Im impossible. But by the end of the third grade, after a school year of that, we were able to literally open up the Encyclopedia Britannica, look at a page, and assimilate yes. everything on that page. Yeah, that, yeah, that, in a so second. It's, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's pretty much like snapshot the page and the information is downloaded to your brain yes. or it, your it went from being yeah. It went from being like this visual game of almost like an Evelyn Wood kind of speed reading dynamics thing. We were even using our hand for a while. But by the end of that school year, we could literally look at a dense page of text and photographs and captions and literally assimilate its meaning yeah. immediately. Yeah. I wouldn't even call it reading. It was almost, as you say, snapshot. It was, it was yeah. photographic reading. Yep, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I have, um, you know, people. I, from the time I was little, I would try to explain to people how I did so well in school without ever studying, and I would basically, they would say, "Do you have a photographic memory?" And I guess, you know, it's kind of more like my mind would just take a picture of the page, and then I would remember it. You know what I mean? Right. And they, so, they, yeah, they wanted us to be able to. Let, let's say. Yeah. They sent us to the past. I say they sent us to the 1950s, and we found ourselves in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They wanted us to be able to like photo read that and come back and say, no, it wasn't Murphy's Borough. Yeah. It wasn't Murfreesboro. It was Murfreesboro, yeah. you know, Tennessee. Yeah. So we had to be able to like perceive things per yeah. and immediately assimilate them and then have the communications ability to report back what we had seen and done. Yeah. And so that yep. was the start of it. Very how far, how yeah. far afield did we throw you in going off on that little dog leg there on the narrative? Well, you mean um, in terms of go, going back to to the learning machines? Yeah, yeah. If we can just pick up there, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to spin off of the of main narrative too far. But oh that no, was yeah, yeah. Jarring, well, well, so there, there were a lot of us who who. Um, who were, who were affected during those critical years of our childhood by Project Talent, which was started by Admiral Rickover to basically, because he didn't think he was getting high enough quality plebes at the Naval Academy to train mm -hmm. to be nuclear submarine officers. But basically, we had talked about how in the beginning part of the interview here, I was going to talk about this, you know, I mentioned how, you know, I've been describing my experiences in the Mars Jump Room program for seven years. I've done, I don't know, dozens and dozens and dozens of TV and radio shows. I think I've done about 100 TV and radio shows on both time travel and Mars visitation. We brought forward now seven whistleblowers, and that still hasn't, that's still not being discussed when the secret space program comes up in the truth movement. So that was basically <laughs> an example of how, of my major premise here, which is that the truth movement is not fulfilling its mission to, to, to promulgate the truth and disseminate it in a broad societal sense. Then I was using this example of 9-11 to show, well, wait a minute. This is a, an untold aspect. It's a hidden aspect uh, of the history of 9-11 that the entire 9-11 truth movement needs to grok. The Bush administration didn't just have prior knowledge going back a couple of days, you right. know, inspiring Condoleezza Rice to advise former mayor Willie Brown of San Francisco not to fly that day. The man who was serving as sec def, namely Donald Henry Rumsfeld, had 30 years of backstory in 9-11. Yeah. So I imagine that when Andrew Card, the White House Chief of Staff, 
whispered in President Bush's ear there at the Emma, uh, Emma Booker Elementary School in Florida. I don't think he said, we're under attack, Mr. President. I think he's probably said something like, it has finally happened, Mr. President. The 9-11 <laughs> that we long awaited is now occurring. Something like that, making reference to how quantum access had identified um, 9-11 30 years ago happen. And then the third example I was going to use is, you know, there was a huge, uh, a huge controversy over whether or not um, President Obama was a natural born citizen uh, uh, under the under Article two. And at the end of all that, even President Trump acknowledged that the president was born in the country. But here's the problem. I served with Barack Obama in the Mars jump room program. I was trained with him. For a short period of time, I roomed with him which gave rise to that stupid satire of us on, on the Colbert Report where they tried to make us out to be gay lovers on Mars. You know, ha-ha. Um, and I had contact with Barack Obama that was project-related in Los Angeles, in El Segundo, California, where the, the West Coast jump room was, in, in the jump room, and on Mars several times. Because after being trained in summer of 80, we all kind of – uh, went our separate ways, and we would just like the astronaut corps. Occasionally, you'd be put with the same team of, of people. You know, you'd you'd run into the people on the project. For example, I ran into William Cameron McCool many times at the jump room facility in El Segundo, yet never jumped with him. Uh, I was fairly close to Regina Dugan in training, but I think I did only two jumps with her. Um, in in the of, of the forty or so jumps that I did between July of 1981 and May of 1984 when I, of my own free will and accord, left the program. The Barack Obama I knew was using his Indonesian name, Barry Satoro. He was a Muslim because I came back to our dorm room when we were sharing quarters, and he was praying to Mecca, and I asked him about his religion. He revealed that he'd been a lifelong member of the sect of Islam uh, founded by a man named Mohammed Sabud Sumawadi Hajojo in Indonesia. Uh, and a Muslim splinter group with about 20,000 members worldwide known as Sabud for its founder. Mm-hmm. He, he, he broadly intimated that he was the illegitimate son of Sabud. He said, who's my dad, but I wasn't raised by him. And so this indicates, and it also corresponds to um, a finding made by MI6 that Barack Obama was not the biological son of Stanley Ann Dunham, and hence, he can't be the biological son of any of the men linked to her, which include Barack Obama II, the, the graduate student that Ann Dunham went to school with at the University of Hawaii, the one from Kenya, Frank Marshall Davis, the uh, uh, black American communist, or even uh, Malcolm X. He, he has to be somebody else's, uh, another mother's son. Okay, now – since he kind of acknowledged that he was Sabu's illegitimate son and had been raised by Ann Dunham, who I knew because like my father and Tom Stillings, the father of William Stillings, Ann Dunham was auditing our training program, our Mars Jump Room training program, which was held in summer of 80 at College of the Siskiyous in Weed, California. What I'm saying here is I've had information all along, and I was trying to share it, about the actual nationality and ancestry of Barack Obama. He is not – an African American. He is not African. He is a dark skinned individual with an Indonesian background. And it was his mother, uh, his adoptive mother, or his handler, St- Ann Dunham's work for the CIA that caused him to be brought to Hawaii and raised as an American. After all, what he was hiding in the birther controversy was not actually his nationality because he was resting his alleged nationality on that birth announcement in the Honolulu Advertiser that indicated that Ann Dunham, an American, was his mother and hence had a, a biological claim under the Vattel Doctrine, what, what's left of the Vattel Doctrine, to be considered right, yeah. a natural American, yeah. right? Okay, so he because he had, he had that leg in place, even though it was false, what he was really hiding was that in applying for undergraduate yes, Fulbright, this is exactly where I was going to go with my question. Thank you. Right, in, in applying for undergraduate funding to go to Occidental College in Eagle Rock, California, as somebody from the, cl- the high school class of 1979 that I was part of, I think Obama's like 40, 45 days older than I. You know, we're we're literally contemporaries. Um, 
and certainly were <laughs> the same, almost the same age when we were serving together, as was Willie McCool, was like five days younger than mm-hmm. me. Obama was hiding that he had applied for Fulbright funding as a foreign national, as an exchange student yes. from Indonesia, because he still had his Indonesian credentials, his Indonesian passport, for example. Now, that put him between a rock and a hard place between either being an American and hence qualified to be president under Article 2, but committing federal loan fraud, which is an impeachable offense, because fraud has been construed to be a high crime or a misdemeanor. In fact, Trump may have to resign rather than face impeachment for fraud. So he had either committed the fraud of alleging that he was a an Indonesian, but he's saying, oh, I was really an American, but wait a minute, you got a an undergraduate Fulbright scholarship, those only go to foreign students. Or uh, he had defrauded the program and was an American. So so, so he was really caught between a rock and a hard place of establishing that he was an, an, a natural-born American or that he had gone to, to Occidental on a Fulbright as a foreign student. He had to choose between basically two unpalatable uh, alternatives, either being disqualified under Article 2 as not an American or having committed federal loan fraud, which is an impeachable offense. So Obama had to lie about his nationality. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is look at who – look at everybody we could put under the umbrella of truther or indeed birther relative to Mr. Obama's nationality. They would include relatively brilliant and well-educated Well, let's start with Donald but- Trump. I mean, oh, Donald, yeah, I was going to say Donald Trump was actually <laughs> people forget this now. Donald Trump was a key figure in the early birther movement. Actually, the right. first birther was Hillary Clinton herself, wasn't it? Right. So here you have a Yale yeah. educated first lady, senator and secretary of state. You've got a Wharton, you know, University of Pennsylvania educated 45th president of the United States, Donald John Trump. And I was going to mention another relatively distinguished American, Dr. Jerome Corsi. Yeah. Harvard PhD. Okay, now think of those three individuals in terms of their intelligence, their life accomplishment, and their education. People you would appoint if they weren't so unpopular as individuals, certainly Hillary, especially. Um, uh, not to not to disparage Dr. Corsi, but if those individuals were uh, were up for a position on any kind of pet presidential commission, they would probably be approved by 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 Congress to serve on some important. Uh, Senate or House or Presidential Commission, right? In other words, they're they're pillars of the American community. But even after the president-elect state, stated the falsehood that Obama was born in the United States, um, those three individuals in the truth movement, broadly defined, certainly Corsi and Trump would be placed under that umbrella. I don't believe Mrs. Clinton would be, but nonetheless, these were leading American figures who were advancing the notion that there was a there was a reasonable question a question that reasonable people could disagree about as to president obama's nationality okay to this day it is still not known that there are multiple points of evidence from multiple individuals not just including myself that established that obama was an acolyte of the cia and was an indonesian who had used his indonesian nationality to get funding to go to college initially in fact i was instructed, I was ordered by the CIA in summer of 1981 to transfer from UCLA, where I was attending college, to where? To Columbia. Who else was instructed to do that by CIA? Barack Obama. Okay. I even informed the professor emeritus at at Columbia, who was making the the case that Obama had had never attended class there and yet had had been given a uh, B.S. in political science or B.A. in political science with a, a degree of B minus. I was told by Courtney Hunt of the CIA that if I transferred to Columbia to hide the jump room program activities I was immersed in and maybe some other work on, on Earth for the CIA, that I would get a, basically a Columbia University degree that I never would have to work for. I would just have to attend a few seminars, a few classes to create a paper trail that I had gone to gone to school there. Okay, what I'm saying here is This issue was thoroughly vetted in the mainstream and the alternative media. We had prominent Americans looking into it, and the truth did not emerge. The truth is that Barack Obama is a native of Indonesia. By his own admission, he was the illegitimate son of a man who founded a Muslim sect there, Sabud himself, Mohammed Sabud Sumawadi Hajojo. 
the British intelligence service MI6 found that he was not the biological son of Stanley Ann Dunham. His matrilineal DNA had no biological markers, no genetic markers for Anglo-Saxon ancestry. Okay, so Barack Obama, in terms of his nationality and the fact that he has been a career CIA agent, remains obscured. Okay, that's not a truth movement. Okay, that's that's a movement that stumbles around and points fingers and makes accusations, but does not cause the truth to emerge. And that's, in fact, why I selected these three examples to, to start off tonight's show. That's what's going on. The truth movement is not fulfilling its mission. And those are the three most pertinent examples I could think of. Yeah, those are very uh, very good points. I want to go back to 9-11 for a second, real quick. quick. Those okay. pe- the, the, you said there's a team of academics. Let me, go, let me pull up the document again so I can make sure I'm speaking correctly here. So that there was a team of academics that um, – that you know we're working to sort of uh, you know <coughs> working against you. We're you know we're subvert- that they sub- were sub- subverted by a team yeah. of academics. And then is this below what you said? The uh, James Fetzer, Kevin Barrett, Bar- Barbara Honiger is out here speaking about. Yeah, what happened is I I filed the uh, I was the first witness to file my affidavit. It was ten pages uh, and it just revealed everything somebody needed to know to know the truth that nine eleven was detected by Project Pen and passed on to the CIA 30 years before it happened as a result of the quantum access capability that, that DARPA gave CIA by developing time travel. After I filed that, after I filed the affidavit, but before they questioned me, before I appeared before the committee, before the Vancouver 9-11 Tribunal founded by Judge Alfred Weber and Judge Connie Fogel, Dr. James Fetzer, Dr. Kevin D. Barrett, and Barbara Honiger another witness, another tribunal witness who had worked for Rumsfeld, began a a campaign of jury tampering and witness intimidation where they sent literally... That was pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. Wow. All righty. Carry on. (laughs) That's okay. I'll glitch. Randy, are you still there? Okay. 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 Okay, So, yeah. So Dr. James Fetzer, Dr. Kevin Barrett, and Barbara Honiger, who had worked for Rumsfeld, began a program of witness tampering and, you know, jury tampering and witness intimidation, sending hundreds of emails to everybody else who was scheduled to testify, making me out to be a lunatic rather than somebody who had helped develop time travel for the country. And their whole thrust was on their meme management about what 9-11 had to be about. In other words, they wouldn't even discuss with me the truth that I was sharing. They had established what 9-11 was about, and they were then going to arrive at their findings based on their beliefs. In other words, most people are not scientific. All of us should gather evidence and then arrive at our beliefs based on our findings, not arrive on our findings based on our beliefs. That's a cornerstone principle of the interpretation of evidence, of scholasticism, of of academic ethics, in fact, not just academic methodology. And these three... Well, two of them are university academics. Barbara Honiger is more of a political operator. But they literally were defaming me mercilessly without even picking up the phone and calling me and saying, saying, well, who are you? How do you know these things? Have you been screened by a psychiatrist? Can you give me other evidence of what the time travel program involved? Why are you inserting yourself in the 9-11 truth movement? They could have grilled me for hours because I was available to provide any question that they that they asked an answer of me and yet instead they stigmatized me before all of the other members of the tribunal and crashed the tribunal the net effect was that to this day the 9-11 truth community does not know that that information because they suppressed it yeah i mean i i i i i I certainly haven't heard it discussed at all in the 9-11 truth community here's my question um So one of these people in particular, maybe two, I'm thinking of James Fetzer, was also a person who um, gave a lot of heck and problems to Dr. Judy Wood um, with her the research that she's done on 9-11. And it's interesting to me that her research implicates the use of uh, Tesla-style technology on 9-11, and he tried to destroy her too. So you're talking about... Um, this event being seen from the past, you know, being traveling into the future and seen using Tesla technology. And she's talking about the event being pulled off 
you know, possibly by directed energy weapons, all that, you know, kinds of things Tesla came up with. And James Fetzer is leading the charge against both of you. I find that very interesting. That may be a pattern, but, you know, I, w I want to stick with what I know, but I will, yeah. I will say this. The broad contours of the government COINTELPRO operation that is causing the truth movement to not fulfill its destiny, in my view, they tend to hide three things. And so my findings in a broad sense, in, in general terms, is completely consistent with what you're speculating about, Dr. Fetzer. And yeah. that is they try to hide the existence of specific programs, who was in them, and the technologies involved. I'll give you an example. I believe that the History Channel is a CIA proprietary because I was interviewed by their people for an entire day of shooting when I appeared on William Shatner's show on the History Channel in 2011. And yet they got my father's name wrong. His name was Raymond Francis Bashago, and they said his name was Frank Bashago, which in fact was the name of his father. I don't know where they got that from because, I mean, my grandfather was an obscure Polish-American coal miner from rural Pennsylvania. Um, my dad went from those roots to help develop time travel for our country. I'm very proud of that. Um, they also allege that the time – I'm just describing eight modalities of time travel, and yet they allege that the time machine that Project Pegasus developed was developed by my late father in our garage in Morris Plains, New Jersey. In fact, in fact, he was reporting to the quintessential Project Manhattan physicist, Dr. Harold M. Agnew, at the time that Agnew was first director of the weapons division, the W division at the labs. And then when we were doing most of our work on Pegasus, Harold had already become the director of the entire Los Alamos National Labs, which, as, as you know, is the nation's leading uh, uh, nuclear bomb facility. OK, so um, – and it was secretly developing things like time travel. So I, I can't believe – you know, having b – being a graduate of UCLA and Cambridge and working in the history field myself for three years, performing oral histories uh, for UCLA for the uh, – the regents of the University of California and, and UCLA, I can't believe that the, 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 the rank suppression of another witness's testimony has any place in contemporary historiography. And I would also add that one of the great canards that's being advanced by these his historian types in the truth movement is – and I, I would include James Fetzer, Richard Dolan, and even Dr. Michael Sal. I recently had a discussion with Michael about this. And that is they're resting their, their books and articles and, and claims in the alternative and mainstream media on documents. But in fact, since the late 1980s, when I was doing oral histories for UCLA, uh, interviews of living witness participants are considered not only just as reliable as documentary sources, but even more reliable because a document can lie because whoever wrote it could have been lying or mistaken. But a living witness is able to be cross-examined, whatever their testimony is, whether it's what they experienced cr uh, charging the beach at Normandy during World War II or what it was like to uh, – I, I interviewed one man who had been an office boy from uh, – from William Mulholland and J.D. Lippincott when they built the Owens Valley Aqueduct that brought water to Los Angeles in 1913. I mean, the oral history field has burgeoned. And how can we say that we're the, the, the curators, that we're the catalysts for truth-telling in parapolitics, parascience, and, and the paranormal, and yet we're going to censor living witness participants and say their testimony doesn't matter. They could be lying and rest our, 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 major, our major written works in the field on dry documents from the CIA and the FBI, it, many times in which the, 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 the most valuable information in the documents has been redacted, redacted literally yes. blacked out under the National Security Exemption to the Freedom of Information Act. Okay, so this has to be confronted. People yeah. attending conferences with these university-trained historians alleging that they're the champions of the truth. These individuals have to be confronted. Dr. Fetzer and Dr. Barrett have to be confronted at these conferences. Sir, I respect your, your learning. I respect your work. In some cases, it's excellent. I yes. often agree with what you write in Veterans Today or what have you, but your treatment of Andrew D. Bashago was unethical. Indeed, it was atrocious because he had valuable information to share, and instead of letting him testify before the Vancouver 9-11 Tribunal, you sunk the tribunal. That's not the, the investigation of truth. That's subversion. That's a COINTELPRO strike against the truth 
and it's telling. Now, in the case of Michael, let me add that I spent a number of days with Michael presenting at Joan Ocean's recent event at Kona in March of this year. And in fact, we have, by basically always treating each other respectfully at the end of the day, even though he was basically alleging that I was a CIA agent rather than a CIA whistleblower, uh, Michael and I have buried the hatchet, and he's going to be investigating my time travel claims utilizing the Freedom of Information Act to do so. And he has believed me ever since my August 14th, 19, uh, or excuse me, 2015 appearance on the Art Bell Show. Um, uh, you know, um, so so by, by not ultimately judging each other's humanity, Michael and I are now allies, and I'm going to allow him to migrate towards the critical information and work with me to prove the historical truth of my time travel claims. But the others, I mean, man, they just tore into me and it was like, in fact, I'm more educated than they are. I don't mean to, I don't, I don't mean to boast, but in addition to having my doctoral degree in law, I have two master's degrees, one earned with distinction at a California university and one earned at, at Cambridge. So they didn't realize who they were dealing with. If they had even called me, they would have learned that I'm not only admitted to practice law at the state level in Washington, but at the federal level. And that makes me a constitutional officer as a result of my uh, my oath of attorney before the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. So um, I just think that this, this, this idea that the truth that we investigate and that the truth that we defend in the media has to be our truth, as if our truth subverts and supplants everybody else's, is simply – not a valid academic concept, and the interpersonal war that's done in furtherance of that mistaken view of of history uh, and of social science, it has to be challenged because it's pernicious. Look what it did. It destroyed a um, it destroyed a 9/11 tribunal under leading jurists. I mean, Alfred and Connie are very distinguished jurists, and it was a tragedy that that conference or that. Uh, that tribunal was sundered as a result of their, basically their illegal conduct of um, approaching other witnesses and saying, well, you don't want to testify for this tribunal because Andy's going to be testifying. I mean, my dad and I were working for the quintessential Manhattan Project physicist. Doesn't that give us historical standing? Shouldn't my academic qualifications, my bar memberships, shouldn't that identify me as a pillar of the community, Absolutely. at least a reliable yeah. witness? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you know, thank you, Randy. Yeah. All of, this, yeah. all of yeah. this puts us into the horns of a dilemma. At Contact in the Desert, and let me just say this, this is not a criticism of the event or the promoters of Contact in the Desert, but we, we're recording this on the 23rd of May, which is two days after the uh, conclusion of uh, Con Contact in the Desert out in Joshua Tree. And at that conference was a panel that included Jim Mars, Michael Sala, Laura Eisenhower was not there. She was invited. Michael Barra, David Wilcock, and Corey Good. Now, of that panel, only one of these people that I see listed here, well, you could say Jim Moore, you could say Jim Mars and Michael Sala potentially would be considered credentialed in some manner to right. as documentary evidence providers. But when we flip right. to the other side of this, we go from extreme right to extreme left in terms of the parameters. What we've talked about between Emily and I and also on the show is there are numerous levels to research and investigation. So on the one level, you have the Rich Dolans, the Joseph Farrells, Catherine Austin Fitz, the people who are providing scholarly documentary evidence at their levels, and then we have what are called the, the anecdotal, the, uh, the historical narrative people, whistleblower in, in inverted quotations. And there's been an insistence on the side of certainly uh, Rich Dolan, who has been very emphatic on record as sedating that he insists that documentary evidence be provided, that we must rely on the work of historical scholars and people who can provide hard documentary evidence and scientific proofs for all of this. And on the other side, we have what we would consider to be the narration of people who are providing individual testimony based on experience. So 
having said that, then we then come to this place where we have the extreme end of it, which is the David Wilcock Corey Good axis, which has gone so far a field of the narrative as to now contrive what I would consider to be extraordinary, even in terms of believability in fabricating stories that have to do with blue avians and um, sphere beings and sphere alliances and a lot of the stuff which plays into galactic councils and channeling and all the other stuff that's new age gobbledygook that has inserted itself into the narrative in, in the paranormal and UFO community. So we have a problem here because we have we have standards but we don't, the, I, one of my sayings is because of the field that I work in, and the wonderful thing about standards is that there's so many of them. So we have a problem here. So how do we broach that? Okay, let me, um, let me scrutinize uh, and use this as an example. I would, I would second uh, your words. We, we, I think we can only congratulate the organizers of Contact in the Desert. This year, Contact was attended by 6,500 people, mm -hmm. and they had dozens and dozens and dozens of speakers and panels. So it's, uh, but, but I think we can also use it as kind of a, a litmus test of platforms within the truth community. It's only through, through events like this that the truth is going to emerge in broad and, and, and books and, and, and media appearances mm -hmm. and media interviews. But, but particularly these, these live conferences are very effective at, at, at expanding the discussion to include more and more Americans. And we can only congratulate them for this, this year bringing 6,500 people under their tent. I, I truly congratulate them. But let me just use this as kind of an academic litmus test because it was contact in the desert and that ostensibly these seven people would be considered distinguished panelists. Let me take them one at a time. Again, just sharing my interactions with each of them to give kind of a capsule summary of actually what's happening in the truth movement. I love Jim Mars, seven bestsellers. He's clearly I think I said to Jim one time, you know, you're one of my information superheroes. And he laughed at one of the ConCon Con events and bought me a beer. And we talked about my experiences. Uh, in 2006 or seven, my then book agent, Byron Belitzos, put me on the phone with Jim. Mm -hmm. And we spent about two hours discussing my experiences at, in Project Pegasus, literally the actual government program that pioneered time travel, that developed it, the research didn't developed it successfully. And at the end of that phone interview, Jim said, well, you know, Andy, I'm skeptical, and then kind of blew off my information. I think because he thought that I was making my stuff up because I was actually a, a principal participant in the research and development of time travel and in the project that achieved it. Okay. Now, Jim went on to basically to husband the, the school of his, historical research around tri time travel developed by academics like Joseph Farrell, or researchers like Joseph Farrell, that put the onus for developing time travel on the Nazi German experience involving the Nazi right. bell. Exactly. He never, even though th this was at least 10 years ago, because it wasn't later than 07, I remember where I was living at the time. Jim never circled back to interview me and has now done several more books where he reifies Farrell's focus on the Nazi time travel work he never interviewed me, but again, think of who my dad and I were working with. We weren't in some marginal part of the U.S. defense technical community. Agnew was the guy they trusted to take the nuclear trigger from Los Alamos to Tinian, okay? One of the most highly trusted defense officials during the war, not to mention a per somebody who participated in all three critical stages of the Manhattan Project, the testing of the critical pile at the University of Chicago, uh, he was at Los Alamos and Alamogordo when the bomb was designed and tested, and Agnew actually calibrated the size of the Hiroshima blast in a chase plane called the Great Artiste when the Enola Gay dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Captain Paul Tibbetts dropped the bomb on, on Japan. Okay, so Jim is deserved widely respected. I mean, again, he's one of my information superheroes. I was thrilled that he cited some of my work in ufology in his book Alien Agenda. He's a great guy. Uh, on an Enneagram, he's a nine or whatever, okay? He's a fine human being. But again, he's devoted to that school of historiography that Richard Dolan has been defending, that it has to be written down to be believed. But in fact, former documentary sources, previous documentary sources are secondary sources. They're secondary evidence, not primary. So we have to demand that our best writers, our best researchers like Jim, focus on 
the personal narratives because that's where the truth lies. I mean, William Whitecrow and I were in the Jump Room program together. We just compared notes with uh, the biographers of Howard Hughes, Douglas Wellman, and Major General Mark Music of the U.S. Army. And we all four of us have corroborated each other's accounts that Howard Hughes's death was faked in 1976, and he was working on the Mars Jump Room program in El Segundo, California, in the early 1980s. And White Crow and I met him there. Now, this is this is the kind of evidence you can only get from interviewing participants in historical events. These are this is the kind of information you can only establish. There was no document establishing that. Howard Hughes's death was faked in April of 1976, and he lived on till 2001, until those two biographers came along. So that's a situation where two biographers of Hughes and two whistleblowers, by communicating with each other, not by referring to documents, broke a major lead in the work that the truth movement should be doing. Now, I mentioned Michael Sala. Michael's approach to me until he heard the interview with Art Bell – in which I confronted Art about meeting him at uh, ITT Defense Communications in 1971, and Art was just flabbergasted with everything I knew and basically acknowledged that he felt that I had met him uh, when he was 25 and I was 10 in 1971 at that facility where I shouldn't have been as a child. Uh, Michael was basically creating a case that I was giving the CIA's position because he, he assumed arguendo I was CIA, and I was never officially CIA. CIA. I was brought into a DARPA project and then a CIA project. I wasn't paid, benefited, given any employee benefits. I wasn't benefited under the GI Bill of Rights. I was basically subjected to a violation of the 13th Amendment ban against slavery or inv involuntary servitude. Okay, I involuntarily served in both of these projects and was never career CIA. Okay, now, but again, by practicing nonviolence, by practicing Satyagraha and not hating Michael for for disseminating the false information that I was a CIA officer, we are now colleagues, and that shows the value of that. Laura, I love like a sister. She's a dear friend. She's a brilliant metaphysician, and I really value her presence in my life. But let's be honest, she didn't go to Mars, okay? There's seven people or six other people who did, and some of us have been waging – a disclosure effort around our Mars experiences for years. So again, this goes to the discretion of the organizers of these types of events. Yes, Laura has contributed to the disclosure movement. For example, she's talked about her ancestor, President Eisenhower's meetings with ET. She's talked about it being approached to take her two sons with her to Mars in 2006 and 7. But when the question of the secret space program comes up, she can't really say much more because she declined the recruitment that was offered. And yet there's individuals like myself. I went to Mars 40 times. As, as somebody who's admitted to the bar at the federal level, who's been covering this issue for 10 years, wouldn't it be appropriate to get an experiencer into such a panel rather than somebody who declines such experience? I'm just saying in terms of the caliber of the testimony, we have to use better discretion in the field. We have to be fairer to all the truth tellers. Mike Barra, good man. I think he's a hilarious individual on a certain level, very funny guy, a very bright man. He clearly made a signal contribution to Marsology in the work that he did with Richard C. Hoagland about the Cydonia complex, the linkage to the um, to the Great Pyramid complex at Giza with, with Carl Munk and, and Hoagland. But Mike has been engaged at least in one instance of plagiarizing my work. He presented material from a PowerPoint that I gave at a David Farman event in November of 2009 at Paola Harris's event in Laughlin, Nevada, <laughs> seven years yeah, later yeah. in November of, um, of 2016. At least I think so. Let me qualify by saying that Mike was challenged during his presentation by a friend of mine from Phoenix as he brought up my data. So we have to be we have to be circumspect in the truth movement because we're sharing information that's that's true but very difficult to believe. We have to evince a higher standard of academic ethics. We can't go around clumsily misappropriating other people's basic data without their permission. So I'm, I'm not calling Mike a plagiarist. I'm just saying in that instance, my data – was brought into his presentation without my permission. We can't do that. We have to abide by a higher standard of academic ethics than is honored, for example, in U.S. academia. Now, I know that, uh, Randy, you've, you've, you've addressed David Wilcock and Corey Good fairly extensively. Yeah. I, um, I'm a little bit at this point. 
yeah, I'm a little bit leery to address other experiences because, after all, I'm sharing information that's very hard to and believe. It, that so was the horns of the dilemma that I was talking about, and it's one that I think we on this show understand all too well because of the extensive background that we both have in exposing this information in sitting down with experiencers and going through their testimonies, many of which never appear on air. In fact, I could say at this point that about a quarter of the people that I've talked to over the last seven years never made it to air, largely because in the end, they didn't want to expose themselves. They weren't confident of their memories, multitude of reasons why that happens. But by the same token, we have also been acutely aware that um, there is a certain level of trauma that's revealed in doing this and mm -hmm. that in some cases one of my me metrics is that broken narratives are sometimes a sign of authenticity because we understand that a lot of people have gone through traumatic mind control programs where they've been wiped and where they have fragmented knowledge base. Again, you know, we're, we're dealing with things on a very complex level from the human standpoint. Do we discount that? Do we just throw that all out and go, well, I'm sorry, but you didn't have photographs. You didn't take your camera. You don't right. have a tape recorder. You don't have documents. <laughs> you know, if we do that, we lose a base of evidence that I think is far too valuable to just throw out the window. Okay, well, let me give, I, nonetheless, let, 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 regarding, uh, you know, my, my desire not to really, I'm often asked, you know, what do you think of uh, Corey Goode's account? What do you think of Randy Kramer? And I think that's fair. But since I didn't work with them, it's difficult. But let me just say what I know, because in fact, sharing what we know and not what we either make up or conjecture or that may have been implanted is really one of the principal uh, principles that, that I want to impart yeah. in this interview. And so, again, I'm going to use the principle not of condemning others, but of sharing what I know and also using some evidential analysis. Let me address David. David's a brilliant individual, a talented writer, and I completely get why he's popular now in the field. But as I've tried to bring my time travel information forward, I know to a personal certainty that in some instances, David's presentation involves him prevaricating. Prevaricating falls between making something up fa in a fanciful way and lying. Let me, let me cite one example. David was giving time travel presentations in which he was pulling up the time machine in the feature film Contact and blithely saying to the audience, we think this is what the chronovisors look like. Now, during that time, David was my Facebook friend. I had already emerged lecturing and giving media uh, uh, interviews about time travel. He never contacted me. I can say that the spherical gizmo in context starring Jodie Foster looks nothing like what the, any version of the chronovisors looked like. Mm -hmm. And when he, when he used the editorial we, that's kind of a verbal device to impart testimony that really doesn't come from experience or knowledge, but that is really conjecture or, or faithfulness posing as data. You know, to say, we think this is what the chronovisors look like. Well, first of all, who's we? Okay, and then second, where did you get that information? And, and third, how did you have a need-to-know position to even being in the room? Okay, if David is going to take the perspective of being an investigative journalist, he has to say, this physicist, this experiencer, this document described the chronovisors as looking like this machine that was later dropped into the feature film contact. He has to source what he's saying. I'm not accusing him of lying. But I'm accusing David of blurring the line between imagination and conjecture on the one hand and certain information or, uh, you know, what the law would call the kind of information that creates what we call a rebuttable presumption of validity. And the net effect of that is that we get a lot of basically bloviation, which is a fancy word for hot air, in the field. I mean – I know from personal experience what all of the models of the chronovisors looked like, and it was just sort of a made-up assertion that it looks like the device in the feature film Contact the Time Machine. Now, I also want to use another example of evidential analysis. In other words, let's not condemn the individuals. Let's analyze their evidence because, look, in a few instances, a very shrewd evidential analysis has been thrown at me, and if you read everything I've written on Facebook at Project Pegasus, my time travel group there, I have withstood that withering evidential analysis and come out as being understood to be telling the truth. But this is the kind of evidential analysis that I would use on Corey's 
regarding Corey's claims because I see that there's kind of this sort of purgative process going on in the truth movement to evaluate Corey right now. And he's now being, you know, psychically <laughs> rolfed the way I was. He's really being vigorously sh sh shaken right now uh, to determine whether he's for real or not. I had the pleasure of appearing with Corey again at Joan Ocean's event in March, and he seemed like a really nice guy. And he described his experiences, I think, with the real air of authenticity. So again, I'm saying this with not to not to declare that I view Corey as a prevaricator, but just to open the door to the kind of evidential analysis we should be engaging in. And it's this. When David Wilcock introduced Corey Good at Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles in February of 2016, David made three claims about Corey's background. They stated, and I heard this, by the way, through one of those automated voices on YouTube, not their own voices. So there could have been a translation error. But what the audio on that YouTube was reporting from that event, from their original feed, was that David was stating that Corey had been initially groomed for service in the secret space program at age six, that he had been activated in 1987 at age 17, and that he had experienced the 20 years in back process of serving in space for 20 years and then being age regressed 20 years and time traveled back in time 20 years to close that causal, those causal time loops and, re and return him back to ordinary experience. Now, I can verify that age regression exists because I was age progressed when I was serving on Project Pegasus from about age into about age biological age 45 before jumping from 1972 to the year 2045. Uh, and, and I can also say that the U.S. Defense Technical Community and CIA have been using the creation and then the destruction of causal time loops to involve people in things and then destroy all evidence of their involvement by basically sending them on time loops that are then collapsed. So that aspect of Corey's account, I believe, is potentially true. But what I noticed about those three claims is they directly mirror previous biographical facts shared by myself, Randy Kramer, and Michael C. Ralph. Specifically, I have given dozens of interviews, and all of them preceded, many of them preceded February of 2016, in which I stated that I first teleported from New Jersey to New Mexico at age six because my father wanted to show Dr. Harold Agnew at the labs that if teleportation, Tesla teleportation was safe enough for his six-year-old, it was safe enough for all children. Then the uh, the second fact also mirrored uh, that of a previous claimant. It was Randy Kramer who stated when he was brought forward by Michael Salas several years ago that he was activated at age 17 in 1987, which means he was be born in 1970. In fact, in my article uh, about Randy Kramer called Corroborating Captain Kramer, I noted how Randy stated that he had been initially brought into off-planet work at 17, which was the median average of all five of the Mars jumpers that were trained in summer of 80 that were then young people. Myself, Barack Obama, Regina Dugan, Willie McCool, and William Stillings. Our average age was 17, and I, I, I noted that Randy was right on target there in describing his age. And then, of course, Michael C. Ralph began the meme of the 20 years and back concept, which again, I don't really have any doubt exists because I was age progressed myself in 1972. And then, I, and then the effect wore off for three weeks and I was sort of in sort of medical quarantine at Sandia National Labs as the biological effects of that, um, of that age progression technology uh, uh, ensued and I was then a 10 year old again. But they had done something to my genetics by having me undergo that. Now, here's the evidential uh, dilemma that this presents us. Either those statements by David, if, if we were to assume arguendo that Corey would ratify David's statements, because again, under the law of evidence, you can't analyze somebody, you know, you can't analyze the veracity of A by what B says about them. So the first impediment here is that these were David's statements about about Corey. But if we were to assume arguendo that Corey would ratify them as true biographical facts in his background, we then have to ask ourselves, um, do, do these three data points corroborate previous claimants or are they evidence of copycatism? And let me say that in not the law of evidence, but in the, the practice of evidence, as I practice it certainly as a trial lawyer and as other trial lawyers practice it, 
the principle basically is that a single corroboration is considered disposing of the reliability and the strength of the evidence being proven by the second witness. So if somebody says, yes, I was also in the bank, and that man over there at the defendant's table was the robber, okay? But then if the defense attorney is questioning that witness to try to, to uh, establish that his client is not guilty, and he engages in a colloquy with the witness, and the witness admits that, oh, yes, the defendant was also a member of his bowling club, and oh, yes, you know something? In the class of 1980 at Adams High School nearby, my sister also went to the senior prom with the defendant. In other words, as the second witness begins to reify more and more corroborative evidence that supports the previous uh, witness, in the practice of evidence, that can be used handily by any adequately skilled trial lawyer to show that the second witness is unreliable, at least, if not lying. In other words, this presents what's known as the problem of over-corroboration. Now, if you consider the fact that that was the first event that in which David brought Corey forward publicly, and the three things that they decided to say about him, or that David decided to say about Corey, were prominent facts in the biographies of the three most prominent previous Mars experiencers. I'm sorry, but that has to be viewed as evidence of fabrication. It doesn't mean it was fabrication, but under the practice of the principles of evidence, it has to be viewed as such. And so, again, the, w the way to get beyond this is to, um, is to encourage everybody in the field to, to not judge each other. In fact, I'm urging that we – because we're dealing in some cases with – multi-dimensional experience with non-linear reality. I'm calling for everybody to practice the principle of basically suspension of disbelief. I've given it the name objectified open-mindedness, which is more positive than suspended disbelief. Okay, it's more affirming. And just say, okay, I'm going to suspend my judgment, but only if everybody agrees only to talk about what they know and be very, very cautious about sharing what they know. Because look, the chances that in one life, that life of Corey Good, Corey would his life story would corroborate three conspicuous facts from his immediately previous most publicly heralded Mars experiencers. It's just totally beyond probability. I mean, this is a permutation function. This is X times you know, the, the Y times Z. It's 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 almost an infinitesimal possibility that it's true. Um, and, and also, let me add this. We know for, we also have to synthesize the findings about other claimants. All of us who were affected by Project Talent, I suspect that both of you may have been as well. I certainly was. We all remember the, the five and a half days of testing every year. Yes. Well, some of those kids went down the rabbit hole of applied defense technical activity. In my yes. case, it involved time travel and going to Mars. But um, we, aren't, we weren't all just being slotted into the Ivy League colleges. Some of us did stuff for the Defense Department and the intel community, some of it yes. quite dangerous. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> so in addition to being psychics for the government. Okay. So yeah. I like to say that you know the kids who became time travelers for Project Pegasus began as, as child psychics for the Office of Naval Intelligence. We were small mediums at large. That's really what happened. <laughs> yes. It's very well so put, by my, the way. My point here, yeah, other words, some of the psychics have bigger stories to tell than they've told. Um, some of them went down the rabbit hole of applied quantum physics like I did. But, um, okay, after all, the Montauk chair is a time travel device, but um, not just a psychic enhancement technology. Right, right. Okay, but, um, but my point here with Corey's testimony is um, when you analyze it and, and, and you see that, that those facts appear prominently – in the life stories of three very prominent previous claimants, it is almost certainly disposing of, of the probability that it's, it's contrived rather than valid life experience that was cited. It doesn't mean that Corey's not for real. It, maybe David was, was rushed for time and didn't know enough about Corey's background and cribbed some data points from previous biographies. We never know ultimately what the truth is. That's another point I want to make is in, these, in this realm, we're not talking about scientific proof like you can subject a certain gas to a a flame of a you know and and have it explode and you know in an early meyer flask or something this isn't science in social science i believe that the standard of proof that's being used in the truth community is basically the one that you know margaret mead used to investigate you know marital uh, pr practices in in american samoa it's you know i'm margaret mead i have a phd in anthropology 
I went to Samoa, and this is what I found, and th this is what I think it means, and this is our understanding of the human race that we can draw from my testimony. That's, I think, the standard that we should apply is the social science standard, the standard of the university anthropologists and archaeologists and historians. Okay, now if you want to go into the beyond a reasonable doubt standard, I, th I don't think you're ever going to be satisfied. But again, if, if people are encouraged to only talk about what they know, to not prevaricate, to not embellish, to sell tickets. And by the way, one thing that David and Corey have done that's I think it's a mistake is – they, they're, they're basically tailgating. In other words, like when when they, when the um, when the uh, uh, Antarctica story broke, and we found out that Senator or Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, Barack, President Barack Obama, and Buzz Aldrin went down to the South Pole to see the 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 ancient or extraterrestrial artifacts there. Immediately, David and Corey started claiming that they had gone down there, and in fact. Corey claimed that a spaceship showed up in his backyard yeah. to take him there. Yeah. He also claimed that he met with Gonzalez, uh, who some people have noted kind of mirrors my informant Garcia, <laughs> offered yeah. several years yeah. ago, that, that that he met Garcia in the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. Well, I've interacted ex my whole life with the U.S. Defense Department intelligence community, and a lot of my briefings have been in noisy Jewish delis in you know, Northridge, <laughs> California, and Santa Monica. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in reality, the guy sitting next to you at Starbucks may be talking to a college student who's being brought along as some kind of CIA operative, okay? Briefings are often done in noisy eateries, not in the Kuiper Belt, okay? So I'm just saying that when figures in the truth movement deserve to be listened to are embellishing and when they're especially trying to bandwagon and get involved in inserting themselves into breaking stories all the time, they begin to lose their focus and harm their credibility. And I must say that all things being equal, I think on in terms of the credentials that were cited, the background facts, and then this issue of going to Antarctica or meeting Gonzalez in the Kuiper Belt rather than in the Roy Ball building in Los Angeles or whatever, uh, I, I think that the beginning of some fragmentation of Corey's credibility has begun. But again, I don't want to stand in judgment of other experiencers because my own account is so hard to believe. But I do want to see an improvement in the way that evidence is used to scrutinize claimants because, quite frankly, I have, I've spent 10 years defending myself against utterly libelous claims and just nonsense that has nothing to do with either my experiences or our evaluation of my claims. And that's going to wrap this first segment of our interview, our conversation with Andy Bashago, detailing a little bit about the truth movement, his own process, and the processes that we begin to deploy to assess and analyze the landscape of alternative media as relates to, we'll just say, extraordinary phenomena. And the reason for doing this split file like this is so that people take the opportunity to listen to the material fully and in context. The full interview is over three hours, and we will release the second part of this within a day of the time that you uh, get this in initial release. We'll also make the full three-hour version available on the website at offplanetradio.com as a bonus download that you can have as well. But it's important to listen, to listen in context, not to prejudge, and also not to put down your discernment but to use it to evaluate what you're hearing and to have a means of critically thinking out the issues at large. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins with part one of our conversation with Andrew Bishago. We'll be back for the second segment in timely manner.